And here we're going to take a second look at the clausius clapeyron equation because it can also do something else for us. So let's take a look here. Here's the equation again, but this time I put in P sub 1 and T sub 1. So let's say the pressure or the vapor pressure at some temperature can be calculated using this equation. But let's say that we can do that also for a second temperature. So we can say that the natural log of P2 is equal to minus the vaporization uh, the enthalpy vaporization for water divided by R times T2 plus a constant like that. So now what happens if I take the difference between the two? So let's say I write the natural log of P1 minus the natural log of P2. So I'm subtracting this from that that's equal to subtracting this from that. And there's a reason why we do that because when we do that the constant will, will drop off and that's kind of a nice thing. So we have the delta H vaporization divided by R times T1 plus the constant. Let me write it over here, plus the constant. So we're going to take that and we're going to subtract from that this portion of the equation, the bottom equation, so that would be minus delta H vaporization divided by R times T2 and then plus a constant. Oop, and I think I want to put the plus the constant inside here. So plus the constant, like that, better. All right, now notice that we have a plus C minus C here, and the C's drop out, like that, because of that. And then since this negative turns this negative into a positive, I can take this and put it first, take this, put it last, because this is negative, that's positive. So we could say that the natural log, the natural log of P1 minus the natural log of P2 is equal to, so time, this negative times this negative makes this a positive. So we have delta H of vaporization, the enthalpy of vaporization divided by R times T2, and then minus, because this is still a minus, the delta H of vaporization divided by R times T1. Now notice, we have the natural log of A minus the natural log of B, that is the same as the natural log of A over B, so I can write this as the natural log of P1 over P2. That's a generalization of that, equals, and here notice that delta H is a constant, is a common, R is a common, so I can write this as delta H of vaporization, the enthalpy of vaporization, divided by R times 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. If I now take the antilog of both sides, I can then get rid of the natural log, so I can say that P1 over P2 is equal to E to the delta H vaporization over R times 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. There we go, Make, let me rewrite that because it looks very good. There we go, R, like that. So now, if I want to know what P1 is, if I have P2, if P2 is known, I can then go ahead, come up here. I can write this as P1 is equal to, bring the P2 over here, P2 times E to the enthalpy of vaporization divided by R times 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. Which means, let's say that I know the... Um, the pressure at a particular temperature, I can then calculate the pressure at a different temperature. Now, one word of caution, look at the R. Remember, R is the gas constant. And we know R to be typically, um, R typically is equal to 8.315 joules per mole times Kelvin, times Kelvin. But again, since the water molecules have attractive forces, and when they go into vapor state, they also still have attractive forces, it doesn't mean that this is an absolute. They're not ideal gases, they're not ideal vapors. So R actually changes, just like the constant before in the previous video, R changes. And R changes somewhere from about 7.7 uh, .7 all the way to about 8.315 for temperatures of 0 degrees centigrade all the way up to 100 degrees centigrade. So there's some variation in R, and again, the equation is only an approximate, it will not give you an actual value. To get the actual values, you actually have to make a real physical measurement. All right, but anyway, let's just go ahead and use a typical value, let's use 7.8 or something like that. Let's say that we know the vapor pressure at 20 degrees, and let's say that we want to calculate the vapor pressure at zero degrees. So let's throw it into the equation. The pressure one, so let's call this pressure one, 
let's call this pressure 2. That is equal to pressure 2. Let's use 17.54. That's 17.54 millimeters of, uh, of mercury, of Hg, times E to the delta H of vaporization is 40,790 joules per mole divided by R. Now remember, we don't want to use 8.315. We use something smaller. So let's say we use a 7.8 times 1 over temperature 2. Temperature 2 is 20 degrees centigrade, which is 20 plus 273, or 293 Kelvin minus 1 over 273. Because we have to convert from centigrade to Kelvin. So 0 degrees centigrade is 273 Kelvin. 20 degrees centigrade is 293 Kelvin. We have the enthalpy of vaporization. We have an approximate number for R. We don't want to use quite 8.315 at these lower temperatures. And we should get something fairly close to the pressure at zero degrees. So let's try that with our calculator. So let's see here. We want 1 divided by 293 uh, minus 1 divided by 273 uh, equals. Now we multiply that times 40,790 and divide by something like 7.8. And that's now the exponent for E, the natural number. So we use E to the X, and then we multiply that number by this. So times 17.54, and I get 4.74 millimeters. So my answer then from this, P1 is equal to 4.74 millimeters of mercury. And notice the real value is 4.58, I got 4.74, not quite what I wanted, but pretty close. And again, that equation is not exact. These equations were formed if you assumed that the curve, the vaporization pressure curve, was an exact logarithmic curve or an exact exponential curve, which it's not. It's not, it's almost, and close enough for our work, I suppose. So, there you go. The clausius clapeyron equation is actually very handy in different ways. If you know the pressure at a particular temperature, the vapor pressure, you can then calculate the pressure at a different temperature using this particular equation. So pretty neat technique.